Here we go. Go. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Art. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, you know, I think last winter, we like never had snow on Saturdays. The road, everything was always good on Saturdays, and now like two Saturday nights in a row, we've had snow on Saturday night. And, and uh, you know, we pray, and I, here's my philosophy, and of course most of us are not working anymore, but back in the day, if you would drive to work, then you should be able to drive to church. That's just kind of my simple way of looking at it. If you would venture out on the roads to get to, to work, and, and I understand every situation is different, but uh, I appreciate your, uh, your faithfulness, and uh, there's, there's people that have a lot more difficulty getting to church than, than we do. So, uh, Book of Galatians, I just want to start out there. Uh, if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 862, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to have you moving around a little bit here this morning. This is part 2 of a, a message I started last week, but uh, Galatians 5.16, it says, This I say, am I loud? I, I've seen loud? Okay, all right. Uh, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So walk under the control of the Holy Spirit. Don't walk under the control of the your nature. Uh, don't fulfill that, those desires of your sinful self. Verse 19 and 19, 20, 21, get into what those things are, uh, the works of the flesh. Then we have the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 and 23. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We have another, and I'm not going to have you turn there, but we have another similar list in Colossians chapter 3. And the point I'm making is this. God has, Peter is not the only one that gives us a list of qualities that God wants us to have in our life. Uh, we have it here in Galatians. We have it in Colossians. We have it in Peter. Uh, Paul wrote one to Timothy. And so there are numerous places in the Bible where God says, these are the things that I want to see in your life. And so back to 2 Peter chapter 1, more towards the back of your Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, Pew Bible, it's page 897. And so we've been looking at these qualities, these ingredients, these characteristics that God wants us to have. And I'm going to just read verses 5 through 7. So 2 Peter 1, verse number 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. This list of Peter we must remember, is God's list. It's not Peter's list, it's God's list. And God, through Peter, commands us to put these qualities into our lives. And it really doesn't give details as to how, but it does give the mindset. Giving all diligence, verse 5. Giving all diligence, that means do it wholeheartedly wholeheartedly throw yourself into making these qualities part of who you are we are to uh, and and it's the mindset is not only don't just add them the word there is just doesn't don't sprinkle a little bit you know we have we have a lot of christians that sprinkle a little god in their life that's all they do. They have, they have a little bit of God that they incorporate into their week and into their routine. And, and uh, God deserves all of us wholeheartedly to give him our all. That's what God deserves. That's what God desires. And so this, this adding isn't just sprinkle a little bit. It is lavishly supply these characteristics in our life. And so if you combine uh, both of those together, uh, those two thoughts together, we are to be working hard 
at lavishly supplying these characteristics into our Christian lives. And it's a command. It's not optional. God wants us to be working on these things. And, and we know it's a, it's a cooperative uh, effort. We can't... These are God-given and God-grown, and so we need God to work with us in those. And so last week I gave you uh, a three general principles. If you're going to add anything spiritually to your life, uh, we have these three general principles. I gave them to you in the form of a little uh, acrostic. I do that sometimes just to hopefully help you remember better. But number, number one, it's the, the map, M-A-P-E, the map. M-A-P-E, wow. Um, I'm, I'm here. I was telling, actually, um, we had a, <laughs> I don't know if I want to go on record saying this, but uh, um, we, we had a, we had a, fa a family Christmas get-together yesterday, and I ate considerably more than I usually ate, and I suffered last night, during the night, regarding it. Actually, I, I had a dream. <laughs> about needing to talk a good Christian friend into not shooting me. Okay, so yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great food. It was good food, but it did some weird things to me. So anyway, that's what I'm going to blame it on, okay? Uh, <laughs> map is actually spelled M-A-P, okay? So the map for adding spiritual qualities of any kind to our life, uh, we need to have motivation. We don't put anything into our life unless we want to. We need to be motivated. And God gives us two reasons here. Uh, it's a command, and really that's the only thing we should need from God. If God says do it, we should, we should want to do it. That should be our motivation. Uh, but it's, it's not only that, it's also, uh, so he commands us, but he also rewards us. Uh, verse number 11 talks about having an, an entrance, but it's abundant and you will, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. It will be a rich entrance. Okay? We should want, if we are truly God's children, uh, we should want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not get in by the saved so yet as by fire, like it says in 1 Corinthians 3. And so the motivation is you want a rich entrance, you want to, by the skin of your teeth, kind of entrance into heaven. And so we have those two motivations here. God commands it, and God says you want a rich entrance into the everlasting kingdom. Uh, it's not working our way to heaven. It's having uh, rewards for what we do. So motivation is M. A is awareness. Uh, because God wants us to have these qualities, he brings opportunities into our life. We need to work at being aware that God is working. He's doing things. He brings things in. And I've, I've told you before, I'm an expert at seeing them well after the fact instead of seeing them while they are, are happening. Uh, case in point, uh, my wife's out in the, in the other room. Uh, we were at my daughter Beth's in, uh, Abby, was, Abby was there, the whole family. Actually, all, everybody was there except our, our three from Texas. Uh, they were all there, and we got left and winding through town and got all the way out to where I could actually not have to go 25 miles an hour anymore. And my wife says, I think I forgot my phone. <laughs> well, I had a wonderful opportunity to be very gracious and to be very Christ-like and to be very aware that God is working in my life. And uh, we'll just say the letter grade for that wasn't very high, okay? Um, I <laughs> so God gives us opportunities. Uh, we, you know, I mentioned this last time, but in the military, you look at push-ups as punishment, not realizing that every time we were doing push-ups, we were getting stronger and we were getting better at push-ups. And so we need to look at things that God brings into our lives as, and be aware of them, that God is using them to grow us. He's giving us opportunities uh, to grow these spiritual qualities in our life. And then uh, letter P, so the M, motivation, A, awareness, P is prayer. Spiritual qualities are spiritual qualities. They're God-given, they are God-grown, and we need to pray and work with God for Him to grow them in us. Last week we looked at 
Uh, again, verse number five, we looked at virtue, we looked at knowledge, we looked at temperance. Uh, today we're going to begin with patience. Add to your, add to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience. Uh, similar to what I did last week, I'm going to give a definition and then we're going to give an example and then we're going to give some other verses that go along with that. So number two, add to temperance patience. The definition of patience. Patience in the Bible is a little bit different than what we think. Uh, it, it carries an idea of being steadfast, being constant, being consistent, being persevering in the face of trials. Uh, it's not just counting to 10 when your toddler can't find a color book and decides to use the wall instead, okay? Uh, most of us have gone through that. Uh, those of us that have children, we have experienced that. What are you doing? You know, fabulous. And of course, they don't use the washable ones at that point. They, they work hard at finding the, the non-erased, but, uh, you know, or being patient when your wife says, uh, sorry, honey, I know we're 15 minutes from our daughters, but we have to go back and, and get the phone. Um, it's not that. It is persevering under trials. Uh, it is a stick to uh, in the face of trials. There are a lot of people that God does them wrong in their thinking, and that's it. They leave God, they leave the faith, they leave. that's the opposite of what I'm talking about. In the patience is an endurance. It's, it's a, uh, a continuance in trials. There's a number of examples in the Bible. Uh, we're going to look at letter B, Paul and Silas, uh, as an example. And notice on your outline I have James 1, uh, 2, and 3. I preached on that. I mentioned it the last couple times. But uh, James wrote this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or various temptations, and, that, and that's trials. Count it joy when you fall into trials. Yeah, not so much. Uh, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. It works endurance. Your faith being put to the test, anybody can walk in the light when the light's shining right, but following the Lord in the dark is more difficult. That's what God wants us to do. And so, James says, count it joy when those circumstances come. And even though James wrote this, uh, Paul practiced what James preached and what the Bible taught and, and what God himself taught uh, Paul. I want us to turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Some of you that chapter might be familiar to you. Uh, Pew Bible page, it's 816, 816, and we're, we're going to look at Paul and Silas being thrown into prison, and their yeah. attitude, and their perseverance, uh, their faithfulness. Acts chapter 16, verse number 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. There was a young lady who had an evil spirit. Uh, she made money for her, I don't want to say owners, but she made money for people by hypothetically, potentially uh, telling the future or telling them, hey, you, harm is going to come your way if you go to this place on this day, so you need to go somewhere else on that day. And uh, she made money doing that. Well, fast forward to 18, verse 18. Uh, Paul, through God, casts this demon out. Uh, the, the owners, masters, um, uh, handlers, um, managers, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're like, okay, her evil spirit is gone. She's not going to be able to do anything. Uh, our gain, our financial livelihood is now gone. We need to do something with these two characters. And so they drag them off, Paul and Silas, city magistrates, the city authorities, and they get thrown into 
prison. Uh, verse number 23. And when they had laid many stripes on them, uh, they were whipped. Uh, probably the, the law only allowed 40 lashes. And so to make sure they didn't go over, they usually shot 39 was the goal. And so very likely uh, they had both been whipped 39 times. They're cast into prison. Verse 23, and the jailer's job is to keep them safe. Verse 24, keep them safely, keep them from getting out. Verse 24, who having received such a charge, and we do understand that jailers then, if they lost their prisoners, they lost their lives as well. So it was a serious thing. Uh, they received, he received the charge, he thrust them into the inner prison. So like solitary confinement, uh, dark, probably cold, made their feet fast in the stocks. Picture I've read is this. So, so think of this, their backs are bloody, they are cold, they're thrown in the dark, uh, they are laying on a nasty floor, their legs are spread out, their feet are tied probably with a chain or a rope to a piece of wood so that they are in probably, I mean, my, I have a bad back, my back hurts just thinking of sitting like that. Uh, and that's where they are, and yet, and, and remember their crime, preaching the Bible, preaching the gospel and delivering a girl from a deep from demon possession that was that was their crime uh, that's the punishment they get but look at their attitude verse number 25 and at midnight there obviously wasn't much sleeping going on at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them that was, they were literally counting it joy to be on trial for God. They counted it joy, and they're singing, uh, singing praises unto God. You know, we, you know people that go through hardship, and they grin and bear it, so to speak, and they're stoic, and they fight through it, and they pull themselves up by the bootstraps, that is different than this. That is different than praising God. Depending on yourself and rejoicing in your willpower and stamina is very different than praising God. They are, are praising God. And the prisoners heard them. What's interesting is their perseverance, their faithfulness, isn't just here singing because they're let loose, they're freed from prison, and they go preach in another place, Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, they get run out of town by a mob who wants to kill them. They go to another city, Berea, and preach some more, and the mob from Thessalonica comes to Berea to chase them out of town once again. The point is, they, oh man, cause and effect. This is, let's stop this preaching stuff because here's, no, they just kept on persevering for the Lord. And so there was a, a real uh, demonstration of perseverance regardless of the obstacles and regardless of what it cost them. Do we keep on keeping on when trials come into our life? Or do we throw in the towel? You know, we need, we, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Something bad happens in your life. Do you remain faithful to God or do you quit? And God wants us. One of the qualities that we are to have in our Christian life is this steadfastness, this constancy, of faithfulness, of endurance, of perseverance that, you know what? Um, Job, though he slay me, Yep, well, I trust him. That was, the, that was the mindset and the attitude that he had. That's what God wants us to have. Uh, we, we need to follow God always, not just when things are what we call good, because God is God and because God is good and because God always does what 
uh, is good. Helpful verses, I just listed them for you. They're verses about uh, tribulation and uh, patience, Romans 5, 3 through 5. You have them there on your outline. Number three, add to patience godliness. I'm not going to have you turn back to uh, Peter at this point, but that was the next one on the list. Add to patience godliness. What is godliness? Letter A, the definition of godliness. Uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, it's reverence, it's respect, it's piety toward God. Uh, another dictionary put it like this, someone's inner response to the things of God, which shows itself in godly reverence. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's people, uh, groups of people that treat God like their buddy and, you know, like one of the pals. And I don't believe that's the attitude God wants us to have. He is, he is God. Uh, we are to fear him, reverence him as a, as a child does a father. Uh, we should not fear him as a judge if we are his child. And yet there should be a, a reverence there. And that's what godliness is is talking about. And one example that comes to mind is, of a godly person is Mary. Uh, this time of the year, Mary's a good one to think about. Let her be. Uh, Mary demonstrated godliness. Uh, she was a young woman, uh, probably a teenager, when God chose her to be the mother of Christ, uh, and yet she was very godly. I, if I remember right, I might look at this more next week, but uh, I want you to turn uh, to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, so you're in Acts towards the front of the Bible a little bit more, Luke, Luke chapter 1, it's uh, 7, page 750, if you're using a few Bible, but Luke, Luke chapter 1, Mary was, was godly, uh, she had a reverence and an awe toward God that is really impossible to miss. In verse 46, the context here, she's visiting Elizabeth, but verses 46 through 55, so that's 10 verses, um, we have, some people call it the Magnificat. Uh, it is this poem of praise that Mary has towards God. And uh, if, if I remember right, there's like 15 different references to the Old Testament in these verses. So here is a teenager who knew God and loved God and feared God and knew the Old Testament even though very few people had the Old Testament. You know, it's not like everybody walked around with big scrolls. They didn't, they, they didn't have Bibles like we do. And so she was a very godly woman. And it just kind of oozes out of her. Uh, verse 46, uh, we see her reverence and her desire to praise God. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Magnify comes from the Greek word megalunu, or megaluno. Uh, but you can see, even in English, you can hear it. Mega is, right? Mega is large. Mega is big. Mega is huge. And so her soul, she, was, she had a large view of God and she wanted to really, wanted others to know about the greatness of her, of her God. And so she's magnifying him. She's telling that he is great and greatly to be praised. Uh, verse 47, my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary had a Savior. God was her Savior. Mary was obviously a sinner if she needed a Savior. She could not be a Savior. She needed a Savior. And so she acknowledges that there. Uh, verse 48, he hath regarded. Verse 49, he that is mighty. Verse 50, his mercy. Verse 51, he hath showed. Verse 52, he hath put down. Verse 53, he hath filled. Verse 54, he hath Hopen, which means helped. You sure get the idea. He, 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 his. Yeah. She is praising and promoting God. 
And so there was just a, a recognition and a, a reverence that she had toward God. She was promoting him in this prayer of praise. Are we like that? Do we know God? Do we exalt God? Do we magnify him? Do we make his greatness known? Uh, that's what Mary did. That's what, what God wants us. That's what godliness is. To have godliness means to have that kind of reverence toward God, an appreciation of who he is and what he's done. Uh, let her see some helpful verses about godliness. I, I gave you on your outline, 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11. And we'll, we'll get to that in our, our study of 2 Peter. But 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11, with the day of the Lord, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Based on the fact that the world is going to pass away someday, and the, earth, the heavens are going to pass away, the earth is going to be burned up, we ought to be holy, God-reverencing people. That's what Peter's saying. Seeing this is going to happen, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holiness and godliness? And then there's uh, some other verses I gave you there that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy quite a bit about godliness. Are we characterized by godliness? Number four, add to godliness brotherly kindness. Add to godliness brotherly kindness. What is brotherly kindness? Letter A, the definition. It is brotherly, sisterly love, but not necessarily to our physical siblings. Uh, I'm not... I'm, I'm going to maybe embarrass her, but uh, it is, you know, when you raise children and they never fight when they're kids, yeah. um, <laughs> and they do, you know, uh, it, it is a joy to see them as adults loving each other and praying for each other and encouraging one another, and I, I get to see a little bit of that yesterday with my, my daughters. Uh, but that's so it's it's a double blessing when you have family members that are believers but this brotherly kindness uh, that Peter and God ultimately wants us to have is a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ it is a love for the brethren uh, we share the same father God and we share the same future heaven and so we should have an affection we should have a, a, a kindness uh, towards one another. And uh, God wants us, we're, we're to add that. That's supposed to be part of our Christian life. Uh, Barnabas demonstrated that to Paul. Uh, letter B, Barnabas demonstrated brotherly kindness to Paul. We're going to uh, go back to Acts. Acts chapter 9. Again, Pew Bible, it's page 808. 808, Acts chapter 9. Starting with verse 1 to kind of lay the context. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Saul, more famously known as Paul, what he later became, was a Christian hunter and a Christian hater. And he was a staunch Jew. And in his mind, a staunch Jew and Christianity do not go hand in hand. Christianity is a threat to Judaism. And so if he found any of this way, these followers of Jesus who said that he is the way, if he found any of them, didn't matter men or women, he was 
binding him. He was tying him up. He was carting him off to Jerusalem so they could be thrown in prison. That's why he was in Damascus. Uh, verses 3 through 6, uh, Saul is confronted and convicted and converted by Christ. Verses 12 through 14, uh, God tells a man named Ananias that he is supposed to go and find this Saul and pray with him and lay hands on him. And uh, uh, when God appears to Ananias, he's a little bit gun shy. He's like, wait a minute, this guy, I know why he's here. He's here to cart Christians off. I'm, and, and God says, Ananias, it's okay. Uh, you go. Uh, verse 15, God assures him, reassures him, go thy way. He's a chosen vessel. Uh, he's, he's now converted. He's going to serve me. And then in verses 19 through 21, uh, Saul has his sight. He joins himself. Uh, he's baptized. He joins himself to the disciples. He even starts uh, preaching. So there were, there were believers in Damascus that he got to know. But now, verse 23. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. We're not told how many, many days is. Uh, but if you, you study this out, uh, and you look at Galatians, where he kind of talks about this, uh, actually, there he was in Damascus for three years. So three years have gone by, and that's many days, isn't it? Three years uh, have gone by, and now people are out to kill him. Uh, Judaizers, who he once was with, they want to kill him because now he's denying their faith. Uh, he leaves, they let him out through a basket, verse 25, and then he wants to go to Jerusalem. Verse 26, comes, Saul came to Jerusalem, was coming to Jerusalem, he essayed or he tried to join himself to the disciples, they were all afraid of him. Believed not that he was a disciple. You know, you, you look at the best way to find out who the enemy is, is to pretend to be the enemy and infiltrate them and pretend like you're one of them. And so that's their mind. They're like, yeah, he's a pretender. Uh, but good old Barnabas, verse number 27. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, declared unto him how he had seen the Lord, how he had spoken to him, how he had preached boldly. So he takes him under his wing and he Barnabas is called the son of consolation. He is the encourager. And so he takes Saul under his wing and gradually the other disciples start uh, accepting him. Uh, Barnabas did what Paul later wrote in Romans 15, 7. Receive ye one another. Romans 15, 7, give it to him on your outline. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. That's exactly what Barnabas did, and then Paul later wrote that. And of course, God inspired him to write that. But Barnabas received Paul and serves an example to us. So what about us? How do we receive visitors at church? Uh, are we slow to accept people, welcome people, if they don't quite smell the way they think we should, they should, or don't uh, walk the way they should, or wear, or talk to, are we slow to accept and receive people? We shouldn't be. Um, the other flip side of that, though, is just because someone walks through the door doesn't mean they're a born-again believer, right? Uh, yeah. we, it, it's different. Uh, we ought to treat all believers that we know are believers as brothers and sisters. Uh, we don't have to treat somebody in off the street uh, exactly as a believer because we don't know, but we certainly should be kind to them and welcoming. And I, I think we do uh, a pretty good job uh, about that. Here's some helpful verses, letter C. So Romans 15, 7 is one. Um, letter C, helpful verses about brotherly kindness. Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. 
in honor preferring one another, Philippians 2, 3, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Ooh. Are, are we doing that? Do we esteem others, believers, do we esteem them better than ourselves or ourselves better than them? I'm going to, as Jimmy would say, I'm going to leave to preach and go to meddling. Um, here's a practical way we can esteem others better than ourselves. We have this thing called snack time. And I absolutely love it that a lot of us stay and talk and chat. Uh, I've never, I've actually never seen anything quite like it except at, at this church. I mean, we do that. We do great at it. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't love the fact that the same five or six, in reality, three or four people clean up all the time. Um, I, I think we can do better at that. And so I just want to, that's meddling, I know. But um, we, we need to, you know, esteem other better than ourselves and honor, put, put one another in honor. And so let's, uh, let's try to do that, uh, be a little bit better about that. A couple other uh, verses remind us of our, our responsibility. Romans 12, 15, I just gave you the re reference in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 26. Uh, lastly, number five, add to brotherly kindness, charity. Add to brotherly kindness, charity. Well, definition charity, charity is love. We talked about that before. It's the old English word for love. It comes from agape in the Greek. Uh, it's the kind of love that led God to come to earth in the person of Christ and die for our sins. Uh, it is the John 3.16 love. It is the Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. It is, it is that love. It is driven by will, not emotions. The results in action, not just words. It is self-sacrificing, unconditional commitment that seeks the good of the one who is loved. What if they're unlovable? So still seeks their good. What if they're undeserving? So what if they're unresponsive? So it is the kind of love that overlooks that and looks at the good of the person being loved. So who besides Jesus demonstrated this kind of love? You already know from your outline, letter B, Stephen demonstrated undeserved love. Stephen demonstrated undeserved love. We're in Acts 9. Go to Acts 7. So just a couple of pages towards the front. Acts chapter 7. 806 if you're using a pew Bible. Acts chapter 7 is all about this man called Stephen. 60 verses. It's all about him. I'm not going to read through all those. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 54. Actually towards, towards the end. Verse 54, Stephen had preached to them, gave them some history of Jerusalem. Verse 51, he tells them that they resist the Holy Ghost. In uh, verse 52, he tells them that they are betrayers and murderers of Jesus. And needless to say, that did not go over well. When they heard this, verse 54, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were infuriated. Uh, they didn't bite them, but uh, you know, we know when people get really mad and they bare their teeth, they clench their, you know, their jaw and bare their, that's what's going on here. And they're probably hurling uh, insults at him. But just being mad and just uh, hurling insults was, was not enough. Uh, verse 57 says they ran upon, the end of the verse, they ran upon him with one accord, threw him out of the city, and began stoning him to death. Verses 55 and 56, he's looking up into heaven. He's seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And so they're literally stoning him to death. 
And in verse 60, And he, Stephen, kneeled down and crowd, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Of course, he did not fall asleep as in sleeping he would wake up. Uh, his life departed his body. Uh, he was dead. His soul went to be with Jesus, who he had just been looking at. But his prayer, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, sounds a lot like Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so we, you know, I, I mentioned this a week or so ago. We, we some, the reason I'm using other people instead of Jesus for as an example is because Jesus would exemplify every one of these characteristics. We understand that. But a lot of times our mind says, yeah, but that's Jesus. He's God. Uh, Stephen was not God. Stephen was a man. And yet Stephen had the same kind of love that Jesus had. Uh, he prayed for them. Uh, he didn't just say what Jesus said. He had the same kind of love. His love was unconditional. He didn't say, I'll pray for you if you stop doing what you do. He didn't do that. He prayed anyway. His, it was not, it, it was not on a condition. It was unconditional. He prayed for them. He asked, actually, for their forgiveness. Lay not this sin to their charge is the same thing as asking for forgiveness. And so he's asking God to forgive them. It was unconditional. It was undeserved. Let's be honest. People killing you don't deserve to be forgiven in the human sense of the word. They, they don't. Uh, but forgiveness and mercy is what they needed. And remember, love gives what is needed, not what is deserved. And so he had that kind of love. And then his love that he expressed to them in praying for their forgiveness uh, was not responded to, not in the way he would have wanted. You would think, oh man, this guy is praying for it. We need to stop. None of that. Uh, they finished what they set out to do. Uh, you know, was he knocked unconscious first? Did he slowly suffocate? We don't know. But that is what they set out to do, and that is what they did. He demonstrated real Christ-like love. I remember our, our pastor in Lake Mills, um, and, and I maybe gave you this once before. He, there was, uh, I, I forget the setting, I forget the, the year, uh, but this Christian is being chased by a man in armor. So this guy is in armor, uh, so it's back in the day, right, Chris, whatever, uh, and he's chasing him. The Christian goes out on the ice, and he doesn't have all this stuff on. He goes across the ice, the guy with the armor falls through. He comes back and pulls the guy out, okay? That is the kind of love that Stephen had, the kind of love that Christ had. Letter C, helpful verses. Helpful verses about loving other, others. Number one, do we love our own enemies? The story I just gave you, that person did, Jesus did, Stephen did. Do we? Do we love our enemies? Boy, we can, we can get indignant against people who stand on certain issues, and we can get really angry. Uh, Jesus Matthew, says in Matthew 5, 44, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Our natural desire is to want to treat them the way they're treating us. If they're hating us, if they're saying mean things about us, if, you know, whatever, we want to do this, if they're cursing us, we want to do the same thing back. God says no. Jesus said no. But, let's not forget, Jesus and Stephen both spoke the truth to them. We have this weird idea in today's society that if you love someone, you will agree with them all the time. No. 
That's not, they spoke the truth. That's why they were in trouble, so to speak. They spoke the truth. We have to speak the truth. Pretending someone is something that they are not is not loving them. We need to love the truth. We need to speak the truth. And we, if people don't like us, it should be because of our beliefs, not our behavior. It should be because of our position, not our disposition. So, do we love our enemies? Do we love our neighbors? Who is our neighbor? Jesus taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan, our neighbor is someone who has needs. Well, guess what? There are people that we meet every day that have needs all the time. And so we need wisdom from God, uh, who to help, how to help them. God brings them into our lives, but we need discernment and wisdom. So do we love our neighbors? Do we love the brethren? I already talked about that. Here's a couple other verses. First uh, Thessalonians 3, more and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. First uh, Peter 1 talks about loving one another with a pure heart fervently. So do we love our enemies? Do we love our neighbors? Do we love our brethren? Do we love our family members? Our spouse, our children, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands, it says in Titus 2, 4. But I said it, I'm going to say it one more time. Loving someone means sharing truth with them. It means sharing truth with them. We will want them to know that God decides what is right and what is wrong, and God has declared what is right and what is wrong. Loving someone means we want them to know that they are sinful and that their unforgiven sin, their not being born again, uh, will land, will keep them out of heaven and it will land them in hell. And so family members need to know that. Uh, we want them to know the truth. This time of the year is all about God coming to earth in the person of man for the purpose of dying for our sins. And so we need to have family members, we need to make sure family members know that. And so may God give us that kind of love that is for enemies, neighbors, brethren, uh, and our physical family members. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we realize that this list of qualities that really uh, characterize Christ, uh, but they're, they were also demonstrated uh, by others, demonstrated by people like us. Yes, saved people, uh, people controlled by the Holy Spirit, people submitted uh, to doing your will. Uh, and Lord, uh, you want us to be like this in these different areas, and we certainly understand uh, that they are fruit, their qualities that we cannot manufacture on our own. Uh, we need you to work them uh, in us. Uh, but Lord, we need to cooperate with you. We need to have the desire. We need to have the motivation. Uh, we need to see that it's a, a matter of obedience and it's a matter of love uh, to you. And so Lord, I, I thank you that you know hearts you know our hearts here, you know those listening online, you know uh, which, which one, uh, Lord, we, we're supposed to be working on all of them, uh, overwhelming, and yet uh, we thank you for the examples, and thank you for the encouragement, and thank you for your desire to help us in them. And so you uh, help us respond in the way you desire, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So what would God have us do? First, uh, are you born again? It's the most important thing. Are you born again? Jesus said you need to be. If you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And so we need to start there. But are you growing? Are you growing as a Christian? The best way here in, in my simple mind, it's this. We get into God's word daily, not to cross it off a list, but to have God show us how we are to be and what we are to do. The wise man, Jesus says, hears and does my sayings. So we need to read God's word with a desire to obey it. And when we do that, we're going to see examples and we're going to see the exhortations. And then God does this work 
inside of us, but it, it has to be with our heart, uh, not just with our head. So are you growing? And then are, you, are we burdened for the lost? Um, man, it is so easy to get wound up about politics. Um, regardless, political party does not determine eternal destiny. Uh, a relationship with Christ does that. And so uh, we need to, you know, have that burden for people and that boldness to share Christ. So uh, make me a blessing is what we're singing this morning, an invitation hymn. Uh, make me a blessing. Please stand. If uh, you are able to, Art and Don and Brenda are going to come, 437.